Good morning, 6 o'clock on this Thursday. We start things off in Charleston, South Carolina this morning, where nine people have been shot and killed at an historic black church. The case is being considered a hate crime, and police are still looking for the gunman at this hour. Details surrounding the violence are still being sorted out, but investigators say the suspect was at the church attending a prayer service and stayed for almost an hour before gunfire broke out. Six females and three males are confirmed dead. Their names have not been released as families family members are still being notified. Now this is an image of the suspect police and the FBI are looking for. He's described as a white man in his early 20s with sandy blonde hair. He was wearing a distinctive sweatshirt and is considered to be a very dangerous individual. This is a all hands on deck effort with the community as well as law enforcement and I think with that effort we'll find this person quickly. We working with them all we can right now to try to find out who did this. Like I said, we, we know this is not a time for the, for to be divisive. This is a time for us to come together, and we hoping that we can keep cooler heads and we stay together because you know we just don't want this thing to, to erupt and, and then Charleston exactly. become something else. But we need answers. A controversial conservative senator has been turfed from his party's caucus following accusations that he had a sexual relationship with a 16-year-old girl. News of Senator Don Meredith's expulsion came soon after the Toronto Star reported that a now 18-year-old woman claims to have had a sexual relationship with Meredith that began with explicit online chats soon after she turned 16. The 50-year-old was already under a recent Senate review because of a high level of staff turnover in his office, reportedly for verbal abuse, sexual harassment, and bullying. He was appointed by Prime Minister Stephen Harper in 2010. More water restrictions could be coming on our way here in Metro Vancouver. The region says our reservoirs and alpine lakes that feed them are in good shape right now, but we are using water at a faster rate because of the hot and dry conditions. Officials say if the situation gets worse, lawn sprinkling could be reduced even more, or the region could purchase water from BC Hydro's Coquitlam Reservoir. They're urging people to conserve water by doing full loads of dishes and laundry and to not use water to clean sidewalks. We are still within our normal ranges, uh, but we are drawing it down a bit quicker than normal. So that right now we don't have to move to stage two of our water conservation, which stage one is sufficient. But we are monitoring it daily for sure. With weather becoming more extreme thanks to climate change, a new report by SFU's Climate Action Team is recommending measures that governments should take in order to prepare for flooding. The report's recommendations include addressing aging infrastructure, updating flood maps, and offering flood insurance. Researchers say change is necessary, as shown by the recent flash flooding in Cache Creek. Residents there were unprepared for the storm system, and property owners were not able to get insurance to pay for the damage. We know that climate change is going to make these things get bigger and worse and last longer. Uh, we have to help local governments figure out how to prepare and how to pay for infrastructure that can handle these kinds of flooding events um, so that we don't have people you know, ending up with the kinds of losses that we're seeing and that aren't covered in Canada by overland flood insurance in most places. Residents living along Vancouver's Camby Corridor say vacant homes in their area are a magnet for criminals and squatters. Almost every night I see squatters uh, entering or breaking the windows. Todd Constant says he no longer reacts to the sound of broken glass in his neighborhood. He says the problem has worsened in the past six months as land is assembled into larger parcels for redevelopment along the Canada line. He's calling for the city to address the situation and says empty multi-million dollar homes are not good for the neighborhood. They should absolutely be rented out. As the owners move out from selling the properties, they should be rented out. Something's got to be done because 24 months of, of no neighbors, 18 months of no neighbors is, is, is too much. Empty homes are a challenge in, in Vancouver. We don't, we don't want to see any homes empty and, uh, and, and turn into a liability in the community. So uh, we're, we're obviously looking at next steps to deal with uh, empty homes across the whole city and uh, talking to the province about tools that we can uh, use to discourage empty homes. 
Well, there are worries of a different kind for people living along the Evergreen Line. Four sinkholes have popped up along the construction route, mostly in Port Moody. And with just weeks to go until the next phase of tunnel boring starts up again, an open house was held at Banting Middle School in Coquitlam last night. People living near Clark and Robinson Roads are worried they'll be dealing with more sinkholes and are losing confidence in the project. Boring will start in late July and is expected to last three months. Well, this was certainly a deal worth waiting for. Dozens of travelers lined up for days in the hopes of scoring a round trip flight from Vancouver to New Zealand for just $475. It was all part of Air New Zealand's 75th anniversary. If you're still hoping for a ticket, might be too late for that. The deal was only good for the first 75 people in line. Airfare, by the way, normally comes in for this flight at more than $1,600. So Monday, Tuesday, what day today? Wednesday? Two nights in the street on the sidewalk. I feel really great, really excited.